It's a late April afternoon in the Central Plains, and this F5 tornado is tracking towards the largest city in Kansas, Wichita. To make a bad situation even worse, this tornado is heading straight for the McConnell Air Force Base. The new threat of numerous more people and expensive military equipment being damaged is vastly overshadowed by the biggest threat of them all. This F5 tornado with winds well above 200 miles per hour is heading straight for a few planes that are carrying nuclear weapons. It's April 26, 1991, and the threat for severe weather over the Central Plains has been building for a few days now. The National Weather Service had picked up on the substantial threat on the day prior and issued the warning that, quote, Computer models were indicating this to be a very significant severe weather producers with tornadoes occurring across the central and southern plains. In the days and hours leading up to this event, an extremely strong trough had moved over the U.S. and is moving east. Tens of thousands of feet up in the atmosphere, the trough contained winds of 85 to 100 miles per hour. Slightly lower in the atmosphere, the low-level jet at 5,000 feet still had winds at 70 miles per hour. A surface low-pressure area existed over southwestern Nebraska, supporting a dry line southward into Texas and a warm front southeastward across eastern sections of Kansas and Oklahoma. The dry line would act as an essential part of this setup, as it would act as a form of lift to help thunderstorms develop later in the afternoon. The National Weather Service, noting all of these telltale signs of a significant severe weather setup, decided to issue a rare high risk for thunderstorms and tornadoes for this day. Meanwhile, back in the target area, surface dew points had rose to well above 60 degrees. An abundant sunshine in the area led to the development of 4,000 plus joules of CAPE. CAPE stands for Convective Available Potential Energy, and explained simply as basically feel for thunderstorms and tornadoes. The general rule of thumb is that you need roughly 1,000 joules of CAPE to have tornadoes, so on a day like today where you have four times that at 4,000 joules, that's going to be plenty to have violent thunderstorms and tornadoes. Also, aloft in the atmosphere, there's a slight capping inversion that will keep too many thunderstorms from forming, which would ruin the environment for the tornadoes later in the day. As the afternoon begins and progresses, the aforementioned dry line races east across Kansas before slowing and nearly stalling across central Kansas. Just after noon local time at 12.20 p.m., the National Weather Service issued a PDS Tornado Watch, which stands for a particularly dangerous situation for strong to violent tornadoes to occur later that afternoon. Early in the afternoon, thunderstorms would initially struggle to develop as they fought with a capping inversion, but eventually as the strong winds of the jet stream approached, thunderstorms would erupt violently on the dry line. As the thunderstorms developed and intensified, a handful of supercells would become dominant and begin dropping tornadoes. At 5.49 p.m., the supercell that's heading towards Wichita begins to spin and a tornado soon develops near the town of Clearwater, Kansas. 16 minutes later at 6.05 p.m., the National Weather Service issued a statement urging the residents in the town of Hayesville, Derby, and Mulvane to seek shelter immediately. And just four minutes later after this, a formal tornado warning was issued for the storm. At 6.16 p.m., the intensifying tornado began to affect the southeastern side of Wichita. The tornado directly impacted the town of Hayesville, where it would produce strong F2 to F3 damage in the neighborhood. As the tornado impacted Hayesville, it began to expand to about a width of 220 yards and started to acquire multi-vortex tornado characteristics. The tornado then crossed the Kansas Turnpike about half a mile south of the South Wichita Interchange. At 6.24 p.m., the intensifying and now violent tornado is approaching the McConnell Air Force Base. As the now violent tornado is approaching the Air Force Base, one of the workers is about to record one of the most notable and recognizable tornado videos of all time.
As the tornado passes through the Air Force Base, it narrowly misses a line of 10 B-1B bombers, each worth $280 million, and two of which were equipped with nuclear warheads. On the base, nine major facilities took a hit from the tornado and were destroyed. In addition to this, 102 of the housing facilities that were on base were also hit and destroyed by the tornado. Surprisingly, nobody was killed in the Air Force base, but 16 people were injured. And the total damages on the base reached $62 million. In eastern Wichita, some well-built homes in the Greenwich Heights subdivision were completely leveled, indicated of strong F3 to F4 damage and unfortunately four people were killed at this location. As the tornado continued on its northeastward track, it began approaching the town of Andover, Kansas. The forecasters at the National Weather Service, now seeing what damage this tornado has done, issued a heightened tornado warning for the areas in the path of the storm that a damaging tornado was on the ground and approaching their location very shortly. Despite this heightened tornado warning being issued, the actual tornado sirens in the town of Andover never went off. At 6.31 p.m., with the tornado sirens having failed, the police drove through the town and the Golden Spur Mobile Home Park with their sirens blaring trying to alert people of the threat that was now coming. Ten minutes later, the now large wedge tornado entered southern Andover and began to impact the Mobile Home Park, which ultimately suffered a direct hit. Of the 244 homes in the park, 205, or about 84% of them, were destroyed. Interviews after the event found that 339 residents were home during the tornado, of which 146 of them evacuated. 149 of them sought refuge in a community shelter, while 38 remained in their homes. As expected, no casualties occurred among the individuals who fled the mobile home park before the tornado hit. However, among the group of people who stayed, 13 people were killed and 17 more would be injured. Just to the west of this mobile home park, some extremely well-built homes were swept clean from their foundations, earning this tornado its F5 rating. Throughout the rest of the city, over 1,500 further homes would be destroyed by this tornado. As the F5 tornado tore through Andover, another one of the most famous and recognizable tornado videos of all time was being recorded. The tornado would continue eastward, affecting the outskirts of the town of Towanda. And then 20 minutes later, the violent tornado would dissipate just west of the town of El Dorado and north of the Kansas Turnpike. Along the tornado's path, 84 frame houses and 14 businesses were leveled. A total of 225 people would also be injured. The tornado stayed on the ground for one hour and traveled 46 miles. This would also be the final tornado in Kansas to be rated F5 before the implementation of the Enhanced Fujita Scale about 15 years after this event. And although this tornado was done, the parent supercell would go on to produce more tornadoes throughout the rest of the day and night. One of these tornadoes dropped almost immediately after the Andover tornado dissipated. The tornado would develop to the south of the town of Cassidy and track essentially along the Kansas Turnpike just like the previous tornado. In the path of the tornado, and documenting it, was a local news station out of Kansas. After traveling northeast on the turnpike along with the tornado, they soon realized they were in a very bad situation with the tornado hot on their tails. They made the conclusion that they could not outrun the tornado, so they decided to seek shelter from it by exiting their vehicle and going under an overpass on the turnpike. Hey, 
As they proceeded to seek shelter from the oncoming tornado, they were about to record another one of the most infamous tornado videos of all time. Get up under the girders! Is that where you want to go? Yes. Underneath the girders. Keep rolling, Ted. He's coming at us. Keep rolling. Come here. Shove yourselves right up underneath. And hang on to them. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. a freight train. It just passed right on top of us. People very upset. People underneath the girders of this overpass. They're still hanging on, hanging on for their lives. It was a tremendous rush. Flying debris everywhere. Luckily for the news crew and everybody else who sheltered under the overpass, the tornado just barely missed them by a matter of feet. Although everybody here survived, had that tornado actually hit the overpass, they likely would have perished, as overpasses are one of the worst places you can shelter during a tornado. During a tornado, overpasses can amplify the tornadic winds, which could suck you out and leave you vulnerable to the tornadic debris. The April 26, 1991 tornado outbreak happened during a time of modernization for the National Weather Service and helped highlight the value of seeing radar imagery in determining where tornadoes were. In 1991, Nexrad radar in Norman, Oklahoma was the only one of its kind with Doppler capabilities. Even still, this radar was not clear for day-to-day -day use yet. In Oklahoma, the higher resolution radar images displayed important storm scale characteristics such as mesocyclones, some of which were seen well over 125 miles away in Kansas that day. For comparison, some of the outdated radars in Kansas could not detect ongoing tornadoes during the day even though they were closer than the site in Norman. Instead, forecasters in Kansas had to rely on the public and storm chasers to issue warnings on this day. In an internal assessment of the event, the National Weather Service concluded that the National Weather Service should continue to implement the NextRad radars across the nation. This event illustrates the usefulness of NextRad velocity fields and reflectivity data to see where tornadoes are. In the years since Andover, the implementation of these radars across the country has led to a much greater lead time for thunderstorms and tornadoes when they're approaching, arguably saving many lives in the years since. And always, folks, I hope you learned something, and thank you for watching.